From its lofty perch in a nutmeg tree, the Pawi sees another sunrise. She doesn't know if she'll see another. The Pawi is one of the world's most endangered bird species. Few people have ever seen it in its natural habitat in the rainforest of northeastern Trinidad. The Pawi is a large black turkey-like bird. Many of its wing feathers are white-tipped, often forming a checkered-like pattern on the wing. Slender black feathers, edged with white, make up its crown. The bird has a light blue face, black beak, brilliant blue wattle extending from its throat, and red feet. The Pawi are usually seen in small groups or individually, and usually when feeding. Their diet consists of fruits, seeds, leaves and flowers of forest species as well as some domestic um, crop species that may have been introduced into their habitat. Pauwe is important to the National Park and Grand River on a whole because one, it's, the, it's one of the island's endemic birds. Um, it's on the endangered species list and Grand River is one of the easiest viewing points on the island for that bird. The Pawi is famous for being the largest fruit-eating bird in Trinidad and Tobago. This allows for the Pawi to disperse much larger seeds than other birds. Seed dispersal by Pawi has been decreasing because the population itself has been decreasing. This may cause threats to the health of our local forests. The researchers have found that the Pawi population has decreased significantly from thousands of birds to less than 200 worldwide. The Pawi is also a main attraction for ecotourism in the Matura National Park. The bird's naturally curious and social nature has become the root of its misfortune as it is easily preyed upon by hunters. They also have a tendency to avoid long flights and therefore hardly evade nearby hunters. Man's intervention has also threatened the bird's habitat. The clearing of forest land for timber Agriculture and housing means less place for the Pawi to hide, feed and care for its young. Pawi usually lay two to three eggs per clutch. However, um, not all of these eggs will make it to adulthood. And the slow growth rate of the species also leads to concern for the recovery of the species. The Pawi also has natural enemies and young hatchlings who have not yet left the forest floor are easy targets for a hungry ocelot, tyra, snakes, or even hunting dogs. These activities continue to jeopardize the future of these unique birds and could result in the extinction of a species from the planet. The Pawi was designated as an environmentally sensitive species by the EMA in 2005. It is also protected under the Conservation of Wildlife Act. In addition to protecting the species through designation, the EMA has also designated the Pawi's main home range in the Matura National Park as an environmentally sensitive area. According to the Environmental Management Act, one can be fined up to $100,000 and face imprisonment for up to two years if one commits an offense as outlined in the EM Act against an ESA or ESS. The Forestry Division is one of the key agencies responsible for enforcing laws that protect the threatened species. The Pawi is also the focal point for a number of scientific research projects. These studies are aimed at gaining a complete understanding of this threatened species. There's a lot we need to learn about the Pawi. Researchers are still trying to find out more about its habitat preferences, its breeding biology, its diet, the health of the species and its general behavior. It's, I would say, dear to say, it's one of our national treasures. We, it's something that we need to protect and conserve. You used to get them all over now, you get them mainly in the northern or the northeast range of Trinidad. Well, my group, together with other NGOs such as Brasso Seco, um, group outside Matura, we do a lot of environment work and protection in Pawi um, with other state agencies such as EMA to help protect and conserve a wonderful species like this in order for the youths and them to benefit and know what this animal is about. 
Public education strategies uh, target both children and adults and include informative and interactive programs such as workshops and presentations, CDs, signs, posters, brochures, anything that can get the information across to the public. For over a hundred years, the Pawi has survived the countless natural and man-made threats and now it faces some of its darkest days. But man also holds the key to its future. Awareness, education and respect for this environmentally sensitive species will ensure many more sunrises for her and her family. The Matura National Park is the largest protected area in Trinidad and Tobago. With an area of over 9,000 hectares, it measures about one-third the area of Tobago. This forest was designated an environmentally sensitive area by the Environmental Management Authority in 2004, and it is located at the eastern end of Trinidad's northern range. The Matura National Park is located at the eastern part of the Matura Forest Reserve. Part of it is abandoned cocoa and coffee estate. And there are about 5% within the park, there are people who live there. Right? People on their private property, right? Private land. That's where the cocoa and coffee estate are made up of. So there are people who live within the park, right? That's the private land section. But most of it is um, evergreen forest. And I believe it's the only remaining piece of green forest within Trinidad and Tobago. The Matura National Park, one of the richness uh, which makes this park unique in Trinidad and Tobago, is one you there's a river sea relationship between the Salibi River and the Rio Seco um, River. The uniqueness itself of the unique landscape, we have the Rio Seco Sulphur Spring the Rio Seco waterfall and most significantly the Rio Seco rock bridge form formation. The flora component of the, the, the park itself is, the, with, is specified by its rich mountain forest which is about 3,000 hectares and we have species such as the water care inside here, we have the Mora excelsa, Cap Capo, we have Siret, these form some of the predominant flora species we have there, but we also have the rich endemism of species of fauna inside here as well. The Matura National Park is home to the, our endemic Pawi. We have our endangered ocelot, plus there has been recent sighting of the, the river otter within parts of the, the Matura National Park itself. The, within the National Park, you will find all of the existing species of uh, fauna in Trinidad. And that's unique because you have an, uh, an opportunity to see a booty deer, lap, wild hog, ocelots, um, you name it. That's the only area that you can probably accurately see these animals. It has a unique range of, of flora. It has pristine, untouched rivers and it's accessible, it's accessible, especially on the Grand River side. Grand River is one of the, the, the two gateways to the park and because of that, it attracts a lot of ecotourists, both national and international. Well, agricultural purposes, farmers there who have their estate, who still see about their cocoa coffee estate, with banana, planting, citrus, you just name it, farming in general. The park is surrounded by 14 coastal communities, including Matura, Balandra, Grand River, and Matlot. The livelihoods of the people who live here depend partially on the resources of this protected area. One of the main objectives of safeguarding this area is to protect critical wildlife habitats and control the threat of illegal hunting throughout the park. According to the Environmental Management Act, one can be fined up to $100,000 and face imprisonment for up to two years if one commits an offense as outlined in the EM Act against an ESA or ESS. 
Forest fires are also a threat to the species that inhabit this park. Whether man-made or natural in origin, a wayward spark has the potential to turn parts of this pristine forest into a spiral of smoke. The Forestry Division of the Ministry of the Environment and Water Resources is responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the Matura National Park. All activities within the park um, is vested in the authority of the National Park Section of the Forestry Division. In 2004, a stakeholder management committee was set up by the EMA to oversee the management of the park. This continues to be done through meetings with main agencies, community-based organizations, and non-governmental organizations involved in the area. The, the Material National Park presently is managed by the Forestry Division in collaboration with communities. Communities do voluntary patrols. On those patrols, you will remove litter. On anything that's not natural to the park, uh, Forestry Patrol has the oversight in terms of the enforcement. So it's a collaborative effort between community and state. And the community really is the one who is in there because the park is within their environs. There is also a need to promote and facilitate nature-based tourism and to better understand the park's ecology from a scientific perspective. Currently, scientists are studying over 200 species of trees and vines found in the forest and their relation to species on the South American mainland. The EMA plays an important role in public education and awareness of the Matura National Park. These strategies take the form of lectures, interviews, media releases, signage, posters and special publications. Some programs are also specially targeted to children and young adults. We attract every year to this community alone persons from over 100 international destinations who come to see turtles, just turtles. These are ecotourists. And what we, have, what we have observed is that one of the things they inquire, what else can we do while we're here? Are there any interesting things we can see? These are people coming from very polluted environments, no fresh air. Um, relatively, they have never experienced a clean running river where they live. The Matura National Park is a potential gold mine for ecotourism. If we can train and develop ecotourism, if we can take the community people and get them trained as guides to take people into the park to observe the wildlife, to, 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 to bask in the beautiful rivers and waterfalls, and they, are, and they get paid for their service, what you will find happening is that the park, with its abundance of, of, of in sustainable income opportunities, would create livelihoods for the communities and at the same time lend to the protection and better management of the park. Securing its long-term survival rests on our intervention through sharing knowledge about the area, reporting illegal activities and through sustainable management. The Matura National Park is an international treasure, one that we must manage responsibly to ensure its continued existence for generations to come. Once thought to be mermaids by shipwrecked sailors, the West Indian manatee is also known as the sea cow. Unlike the mermaid though, the manatee has a fusiform body, meaning that it is tapered at both the head and the tail, with no obvious neck crease. Declining numbers of the West Indian manatee population caused it to be designated by the EME as an environmentally sensitive species in 2005. So there are two subspecies of the West Indian manatee. There's the Florida manatee and the Antillean manatee. The Antillean manatee is found in Trinidad, um, in the Nervous Swamp in Trinidad's waters. In the mouth, you have what are known as marching molars, so they are continuously replaced. The nostrils uh, have two little plugs so that during diving, these plugs come and seal the respiratory passages, the nasal passages, so that the animal stays down and you know, water does not enter the tract. So it's able to dive and stay, have a nice seal on the, on the nostrils. 
eyes are fairly small. There are no um, airs that you can visibly see, but they are there. They have two pectoral flippers. Um, the skin itself is fairly, it's on the rougher side really. It gets a little smoother as the animal gets older. It can be somewhat wrinkled, especially in the younger animal. They also have a caudal flipper and this end of the body is very strong. So when we're handling the animals, we tend to try and avoid the hind end. It's a very powerful muscles at the back, so this can actually deliver a very strong blow and that can damage an individual pretty badly. A herbivore, a full-grown adult manatee can be up to 3 meters long. Newborn calves range from about 80 to 160 centimeters long and they can weigh about 30 kilograms. Manatees, are, they have a gestation period of just over a year, so roughly 13 months and the mothers or the dam would stay with their calf or the calf would stay with the, with the dam for up to two years so that their reproductive cycle um, can run anywhere um, from two to three years. So that is also in a way a threat to population expansion because they have such a long um, intercalving interval. So between one calf and another it could be anywhere from two to three years. Historically, manatees were found on the eastern and southern coastal swamps, rivers, bays and other waterways in Trinidad. The West Indian manatee was once also found in Tobago and frequented the Buko Reef Lagoon. Now the main habitat of the West Indian manatee population is the Naripa Swamp, which itself is an environmentally sensitive area located on the east coast of Trinidad. In general they don't congregate, so you would not find them in large groups. They tend to be more solitary. They would come together for breeding purposes and then you'd find them roaming separately, grazing um, in shallow waters, usually about uh, six feet or so, um, fairly shallow waters. The West Indian manatee is the largest wild mammal inhabiting the rivers and wetland areas of the east coast of Trinidad. According to the Environmental Management Act, one can be fined up to $100,000 and face imprisonment for up to two years if one commits an offence as outlined in the EM Act against an ESA or ESS. In addition to the environmentally sensitive species rules, the manatee is also protected under the Conservation of Wildlife Act. This act prohibits the hunting of the species and the possession of any part of it. The decline of the manatee population can be directly linked to poaching. This illegal activity brought the manatee to the brink of extinction locally and the mammal has since been recorded under the red list of threatened species by the International Union for Conservation of Nature as a vulnerable species. Our population of manatees locally is very small, if you can call it a population at all really. It's estimated to be just about 25 to 30 animals. So we are really dealing with, uh, uh, an, with animals that we're, we're really dealing with a situation where we have very few animals left and that population rebound could be, uh, could be a challenge. Hunting is not the only threat the manatee faces. Long-term development plans have a serious impact on the hydrology and ecology of the Naripa area. Manatees actually have no natural predators. Um, so interestingly enough, their major threats come from environmental destruction, um, habitat pollution, habitat destruction, um, with our manatees pretty much being localized to the Nariva Swamp and surrounding um, rivers and tributaries. Um, we're essentially dealing with anything that um, destroys the mangroves, um, pollutes the waters of the rivers and, and the swamp itself, dredging, chemical, pollu uh, chemical pollution, so um, runoff from agricultural um, sites that may be uh, nearby certainly would pose a threat. Conservation and management are critical to the survival of the West Indian manatee. This is being done through three major channels, protecting the manatee's habitat, monitoring the status of the species, and creating a greater public awareness of the species. In terms of the manatee's habitat, there is a need to identify the range of the animal, 
and develop specific management protocols for that area. The manatee's habitat should be continuously monitored, coupled with improved enforcement of existing legislation. Local communities need to be trained in sustainable livelihoods and conservation efforts must be made a priority. Here at the University of the West Indies School of Veterinary Medicine, we have started um, that process. We have so far um, started looking at fecal parasitological analyses to kind of get an idea of what type of um, gastrointestinal parasites, so parasites of the digestive tract, um, what sort of parasite might be in our local population. We would like to get to a point where we could actually physically handle the manatees and get blood samples, do, do um, genetic testing. Therefore, there is a need to create sanctuaries for them and promote information sharing at both the national and regional levels. Protection of this species will undoubtedly involve a greater level of regional conservation efforts and local law enforcement. Conservation initiatives are being fueled by public education and awareness campaigns involving both state and NGO groups. Members of local communities are being trained in manatee research and it is hoped that they too will assist in promoting manatee ecotourism. Awareness of wetland conservation is also critical to the survival of the West Indian manatee and other threatened species in Trinidad and Tobago. You have the power to report sightings of illegal practices, discourage hunting of these creatures and habitat destruction, and avoid pollution. Together, we can safeguard the life of this animal for many years to come. The Nariva Swamp is the largest, most diverse wetland ecosystem in Trinidad and Tobago. It is located on the east coast of Trinidad and, at 44 square miles, is slightly larger than the Mutua National Park. The swamp was designated an environmentally sensitive area by the Environmental Management Authority in 2006. The area is the home to a number of sensitive plants and animals including threatened mam mammals and reptiles. It is the main habitat for the West Indian manatee, which is an EMA-designated environment-sensitive species. One can also find, deep within the swamp, the once locally extinct blue and gold macaw, which was recently reintroduced into the wild after a successful breed and release program, and one of the world's longest snakes, the green anaconda. There is a wide variety of, of species located into the Narava swamp, which range from district forest, district vegetation, swamp forest, and savanna grasses. There is a wide variety of biodiversity within the swamp, such as the white chatine, the, um, the water immortel, the hog plum, and for example, well, our group is uh, presently involved in nursery production, which we provide uh, the plants to supply for um, our groups so that when we're going into the swamp they have their plants to reforest the area. Four main types of vegetative communities exist here. Researchers have recorded four types of marsh forest that occupy different areas within the swamp. The littoral woodland is characterized by species such as sea grape and tropical or sea almond. Most of this vegetation was removed at the eastern end of the swamp, which was used for cultivation of watermelon and vegetable crops. In addition to the wetland plant communities previously mentioned, the Nariva Swamp contains evergreen seasonal forest. This is composed of trees such as crapplewood, maho, silk cotton and balata. Lianas, epiphytes and palms are also typical within the understory of the forest. The fourth type of vegetative community found in this ESA is the swamp forest. This community is composed of mangal, swampwood and palm swamp forests. Mangroves make up the majority of this community and are restricted to the eastern side of the swamp. The palm swamp communities are made up of species such as the royal or palmist palm and the Moorish palm, which exist mainly in the southern half of the swamp. 
freshwater swampwood communities occur inland from the mango forest and feature swamp bloodwood, wild nutmeg, yellow mang, and swamp immortel. These forests are home to a significant population of local fauna. However, after thriving for centuries, the swamp's ecosystems are under threat from human activities. Small-scale vegetable farmers also followed suit and started planting in prohibited areas. In the 1980s, there were illegal rice farming that affected the plants and animals in the swamp and changed the water courses drastically. These land clearing activities removed vital habitat for the swamp's many species. In addition, there was a negative impact on the movement, distribution and quality of water throughout the entire ecosystem. The significance of the Nerva swamp and its biodiversity has been recognized for many years. In 1968, parts of it were declared a game sanctuary and a forest reserve, and it was recorded as a Ramsar site in 1993 as a wetland of international importance. Additionally, in accordance with the Environmental Management Act, one can be fined up to $100,000 and face imprisonment for up to two years if one commits an offense, as outlined in the EM Act, against an ESA or EFS. These milestones set the pace for the conservation actions that led to the swamp being designated as an ESA in 2006. The EMA is currently coordinating with the University of the West Indies, the Forestry Division and various community-based organizations including the Plumita Beach Farmers Group to execute the Narva Swamp Restoration Project for the future of our community and country at large. We have learned so much about this project right now. We are in process of going to schools, giving out lectures and and also we, in, in our own homes we are um, trying to let our children know about the importance of the environment and how to keep it clean and safe for each and every one of us. This marks the first phase of a management plan for the area. The project is also guided by a series of studies conducted for the area, including a reforestation scheme, a social impact assessment, a water resources management plan and an historical change detection analysis. This Narva Swamp Restoration Project is, a, is in keeping with the principle of national environmental policy and convention of biodiversity, climate change and diversification. The aim is to restore and conserve the Narva wetlands through the recognition of the services it provides as a carbon sink and a biodiverse ecosystem. The EMA plays an important role in public education and awareness of the Narva Swamp. These strategies take the form of institutional strengthening, training, employment, research initiative, public and school lectures, interviews, media releases, science posters, videos and special publications. We take it in a different approach by bringing persons in our community to our project site so they can be hands-on so in the future, they will be able to spread the word about the protection of the swamp and its environment. The Nariva Swamp is an important national resource, especially for the surrounding communities. Its designation as an ESA provides opportunities for sustainable economic and human development for many years to come. The white-tailed sabrewing is the largest hummingbird in Tobago and is yet another environmentally sensitive species, designated by the EMA in 2005. It is about 12 centimeters long and weighs about 10 grams or the same as about 10 paperclips. It is generally bright green with a dark blue throat and white streak that is said to resemble a mustache. Well, the sable wing have a distinctive feature and that's the reason why they're called sable wing first of all. And the primary feather P10 and P9 tend to be really broad, flat and they're bent at an angle and it gives you somewhat of a sable uh, shape and hence they're referred to as the sable wings. Three outer feathers on the tail are, real, are white, so there are a few other sable wings that also has that feature but the only sabre that we find here has that particular characteristic. The sabre wing's scientific name is Campyloptera ensipinus, which are Greek and Latin words 
that both mean bent wing. The scientific name is also the root of its nickname in Tobago, which is Campi. We're still hypothesizing as to what exactly is the function of the broadness of the, of the saber. Uh, one of the reasons we're thinking it could be used as a, a sex selection. So the males with the broader saber seem to be more attractive to the females and so they would tend to get the, the girls as opposed to the ones that have a narrower saber. They have a really high pitched, sharp, three kind of sound. The white-tailed sable wings are sexually dimorphic, meaning it's very easy to distinguish between the male and the female, visibly. Um, the males tend to be really brightly iridescent color, green on the upper back and in the lower belly, and has a bright blue throat and a white dot above the eye, whereas the female, she has a white line, it's called a white mustachial stripe underneath her eyes, and her belly isn't as solid green, it's a speckled with grayish white. There are only two places in the world that the white-tailed sable-wing hummingbird can be found on the Paria Peninsula in Venezuela and Tobago. These birds are found in the northeastern part of Tobago, especially in the forested area. You have Coffee River Nature Retreat, you also have a Gilpin Trail and you also have on the northeastern part with Louis and so on, you will see this bird only in the forest, not out in the um, grassland area. Hurricane Flora in 1963 reduced the forest cover to about, uh, by about 30 meters. It was a huge loss to the main ridge. Only the areas surrounding Bloody Bay on the far side of the rainforest did not have this impact. And it has taken about 30 years for the forest cover to come up to the um, level of what it was in 1963. However, it was rediscovered by Richard French in 1974 and has since been recorded under the red list of threatened species by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. It is important to note, however, that documented studies on the saber wing population before Hurricane Flora are not available. It is therefore difficult to assess how much the hurricane affected the population. The bird is thought to be flexible in where it selects its habitat, as they have been found in relatively mature montane forests above 280 meters, as well as in open areas such as clearings, abandoned plantations, and in regenerating forests less than 15 meters tall. The saber wing feeds on mainly nectar from undergrowth flowers. Male birds perch conspicuously and defend their territories aggressively against other hummingbirds. This large species is both fearless and inquisitive. Data collected for an EMA-funded research project, as well as findings from previous research, both indicate that the status of the saber-wing population in Tobago is optimistic. What we know is that the females tend to lay uh, close to waterways, and we've seen them nesting in bamboo, or even a wild cocoa in nests that might be about 8 to 10 meters above the, the water um, in small nests uh, with about 2 to 3 eggs for the most. The um, forest reserve was made a forest reserve in 1765 purely for um, the preservation of water and it has remained a reserve since that time. So the birds have been able to recover and proliferate in peace. Currently, the Department of Natural Resources and the Environment, the Forestry Division section of that department, is the group that is protecting the birds. And as far as I can see, they're doing an excellent job. Um, the birds are on the return. Uh, we see a lot more sightings now. Um, it seems that the groups of people or tourists going in there for bird watching has been kept a more reasonable amount, 10 or 12 in a group, which does allow the bird to show itself occasionally and not start moving its nest in other directions. According to the Environmental Management Act, one can be fined up to $100,000 and face imprisonment for up to two years if one commits an offense as outlined in the EM Act against an ESA or ESS. Within the Main Ridge Forest Reserve, there are few reported cases of illegal logging and minimal habitat loss as a result of human activities. 
The reserve is also marketed as a unique ecotourism destination. The birds play a very important role in ecotourism because 90% of our guests come here with a lifetime list of that bird, the white-tailed saber wing. Right when we got here, we saw the, the saber wing almost right away, which was uh, really thrilling. It's a super pretty bird. I wasn't quite sure what it was at first. I needed to look in my book. And when I saw that it was the saber wing, and then I got a good look at its iridescent front, it was just so impressive and beautiful. And I love that, um, that the people here are trying to, to conserve this bird. I think that's great. Continued management of the white-tailed saber wing includes continuous monitoring of the birds. The data collected is essential for evaluating the effect of another hurricane on the distribution and population size of the species. Trading of individuals to monitor saber wings is also necessary to build a local capacity. While both the EMA and the DNRE continue their education and awareness programs to conserve this unique species. The Arepo Savannah's strict nature reserve is another environmentally sensitive area, designated by the EMA in 2007. Although it is only about 18 square kilometers, or about the size of the southern city of San Fernando, its distinct biodiversity is no less remarkable than what may be found at Matura or Narifa. The Savannah's is located within a roughly triangular area between Arima and Sangre Grande. In further testament to its uniqueness, this ESA is the largest remaining intact savanna type habitat in Trinidad and Tobago. There are three distinctive vegetative communities in these savannas based on the structure of the vegetation and the composition of plant species. These are the marsh forest, the open savannas and the palm marshes. Marsh forests are the largest of the three plant communities that you find in the savannas and they typically consist of forests that usually gets flooded for a certain period of time during the year. The savanna ecosystems are usually open formation or open plant formations that are dominated by sedges and grasses. Palm marshes are uh, palm stands where the palms are really the dominant vegetation and they overtop all the other vegetation at the site and usually they get used by birds for food and as um, places to breed. But birds aren't the only inhabitants of this protected area as a great number of mammals, reptiles, amphibians and butterflies have been recorded in this ESA. The Arepo Savannas are is the home of about 60 orchids, which represents one-third of all the orchids found in Trinidad and Tobago. The Orchid Society is engaged in studying the life cycle of the Cytopodium parviflorum, which is endemic to the savannas. In uh, August 2013, 300 uh, seedlings were reintroduced into the savanna, which uh, these plants were germinated in my nursery. And uh, the attempt, we, what we are attempting to do is actually to reintroduce plants in case the savannas are destroyed or damaged in such an extent that you would have to do artificial means of uh, pro uh, prolonging the lives of these orchids in the society. Arepo Savannas is known for its rich history. And for, for, for instance, in 1930, the area was surveyed and boundary pillars were established. And in 1934, the wider area was declared the Longstretch Forest Reserve. A few years later, the reserve was leased to the United States military for the establishment of a base called Fort Reed. It was part of probably the largest and busiest airfield during World War II. The U.S. military constructed roads, buildings, culverts, and a bunker complex to the south of the reserve. The Savannas has also had its share of unwanted attention, such as illegal logging before and after U.S. military activities. In the early 1960s, um, the area, the Arepo Savannah area, was subjected to quarrying activities both for sand and gravel, particularly the area close to the quarry side, the KP land area. And that went along for over 30 years where quarrying would, was done on a, system, on a regular basis to sustain the growing roads demands in the country. Strong public pressure brought a stop to quarrying 
which had decimated the original palm and marsh forests in quarry areas. In Arepo Savannah, you had a big area that was damaged in the past by quarrying activities. So the group saw it fit to do some um, remedial replanting exercises and so we decided, well since 1998, every year annually, we have been going in into Arepo Savannas and replanting a species that can only be found within Arepo Savannas. There is evidence that some natural regeneration has also occurred since then. Today, the Arepo Savannas is faced with new challenges. The greatest of which is squatting, which itself has been linked to poaching and fires. To combat these bushfires, the EMA has facilitated fire management training to the local communities. One of the greatest devastation of um, the savannas itself and the savannas ecosystem is that of indiscriminate fires. And in indiscriminate fires, we're talking about fires which are mostly man-made fires, either created by people, agricultural squatters in the area compounded by hunters and somewhat in most recent time the squatting, the squatting community tend to clear pockets of lands within the savannas and fire has been used as a tool to um, clear large areas of the savannas for um, those type of activities. Shortly after its 2007 designation as an ESA, the management of the Arepo savannas was advised by a stakeholder management committee. The committee is comprised of state agencies, research bodies, NGOs, and CBOs from the surrounding communities. Sandu began in 1998 to do some conservation work in Arepo Savannas. Well, the group has actually started with the idea to go in and help rehabilitate some of the areas because we had a, about six people who was in CCC, Civilian Conservation Corps, and they used to go in and Arepo Savannas and do work and based out of their uh, exposure to Arepo Savannas, they fell in love with the Arepo Savannas and decided that something had to be done in order to conserve the area. An integrated management plan was developed by Canary in 2009 after extensive public consultations. The main objectives of this plan are to protect the natural ecosystems and allow for their natural regeneration, provide opportunities for research related to natural history and to provide environmental and natural science education. The management plan calls for protection of both the area and its watershed through regular patrols. Under the EMA's legal notice, it is illegal to hunt, trespass, cut vegetation or build any type of structure within the Arepo Savannah's strict nature reserve. According to the Environmental Management Act, one can be fined up to $100,000 and face imprisonment for up to two years if one commits an offense, as outlined in the EM Act, against an ESA or ESS. The EMA continues to fulfill its duty to educate the public about the value of the Arepo Savannas and how it can be safeguarded for generations to come. Strategies include public lectures, interviews, media releases, signs, posters, and special publications and events. The future of this beautiful and unique treasure depends on respecting its fragile ecosystem. Today, entry to the savannas is tightly controlled by the Forestry Division. This, among other restrictions, are the best tools to ensure that after thousands of years, the Arepo savannas does not disappear in the blink of an eye.